lesson that this day will be a little bit of an example. So I'm going to start by teaching uh, 45 minutes on grace. This is, uh, it's not exactly part one of a four-part series because I knew it was just kind of a standalone thing, so I, I moved some things around. Uh, but this is going to be grace. Uh, it's not just for salvation anymore. <laughs> My title. So uh, I'd like to stand up before the Monticelli settles. And I'm going to leave you in the first verse of Amazing Grace. I don't know if y'all know it or not. Just take it going out on the lamp here, but I'll, I'll get her started. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saves a wretch like me. Yeah, sweet. For 
for wait, how's for the wages? The wages of Susan. Yeah, yeah, I just think it's right. Right. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. I knew yeah. I could, I'm like it's fun. Yeah. The gift of God. I can yeah. You got it. So what about Isaiah 53, 6? All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. What about Romans 3, 10 through 12, which I can't quote, but I've got a good paraphrase. There's none good, not one. I mean, there's no equivocating there. So I would just like to ask, if you've ever shared your faith with someone, have you ever had someone disagree with that? Because, I mean, it's possible, and it does happen sometimes. But if you ever, look, you're a sinner. I remember Bill Hybels telling a story about being on the plane, and a guy said, I'm just, I'm better than most people. I give, I go to church, and, and I do all these things. And so I think he pulled out a piece of paper, and he said, let's just do a little thing here where I'm going to put like a one is a really bad person, and a ten is a really great person. He said, I know this is a little unusual, but I happen to be somewhat kind of friends with Billy Graham, and he, I heard him say one time, that he thinks on that scale, he's about a four. Now, where would you rate yourself? <laughs> That's a tough one. That's a tough one. <clears throat> so, I'm going to put down as our first big eternal truth is we're, we're all sinners. And to steal a little bit from that Sin and How to Kill It series, one of the reasons why Maybe the most best reason why sin is bad and it contradicts God's law. There's all kinds of things you can say about it. But because there was a way things were supposed to be. And the Old Testament prophets knew this. And Isaiah and Jeremiah they talk about the lamb laying down with the lion. And it talks about this peace, which you think of when you hear the word shalom. But there's another meaning for the word shalom that's a little broader and a little more descriptive, really. And it's called, uh, human flourishing, universal human flourishing. And uh, this guy, uh, Cornelius. Uh, Plantina uh, wrote a book called Not the Way It's Supposed to Be. He describes, imagine a world where people were really happy for the great things that happened to other people and they cooperated. And if you and I were different, I saw that as an awesome thing as opposed to something I'm going to use to try to discriminate against you. And it really paints a great picture of there's a way things are supposed to be and it's not. And the word I like to use to describe that is friction. There's a lot of friction. You, you try to fix something. You try to have a relationship with somebody. You try to get things accomplished. You try to control the thoughts in your head that go flying away in simple directions. So there's just a lot of friction, and you just feel inside. There's something that's just not right. So things are not the way they're supposed to be. So that's number one. And I, I'm assuming, since no one is objected yet, that we get universal agreement on that in this room. We're all sinners, right? Okay. So Romans 3, 10 through 12, I actually have it written down here. There's no one righteous, not even one. There's no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is none who does good, not even one. There's a phrase you could use to describe that, spiritual bankruptcy. Now usually, if a business declares bankruptcy, they have a few assets they can sell to at least make the debt go down a little bit. They can sell the building, you know, something like that. They, equipment, something. But in this case, it's talking about we had no assets, nothing to help make a partial down payment or anything. Here's another one, Isaiah 64, 6. Our righteous acts, and if the Bible ever had air quotes, it would be right here. Our righteous acts are like filthy rags, right? So, you know, what's the phrase? I know you want to know it. It's like, I wouldn't trust my best second <laughs> to get me into heaven. That, that, that's some, some pretty condemning stuff, right? But there's a second universal truth. This applies to everybody, and so that's why I use that word all. For Christians, just real simple. We're forgiven. So, grace, amazing. Amazing grace. Because if Lee said something unkind about me behind my back, and then he felt bad about it. He came up and said, I said that your hair looked goofy that night you got up and talked. <laughs> I feel bad about it. And he apologizes. It's pretty easy to say, I know my hair could look kind of goofy, so I, I, no problem. I give me a big hug and we go on. But if Tom comes in and threatens my family and steals my TV and kicks my dog and says bad things about Albert, <laughs> which he might do, <laughs> uh, then, then, you know, it's, it's a little harder, right? So, so when a jeweler wants to show off the, the awesomeness of a beautiful diamond, do they set it on a white piece of paper? 
What did they set it on? Black felt. Deep, dark, black. Not gray. <laughs> Not charcoal gray. Black. And why do they do that? It makes it spark more. It makes it stand out. So, would you agree that the worse off we are here, the more amazing the grace is here? So here's a concept that, that's really not so much part of the lesson, but I just always like to say I can never really pass up this opportunity. <coughs> Some people have the idea. Uh, all right. Let's see. All right, Steve. Pick on you again. All right. Steve and I, a few years ago, went to the Grand King. And we were out there with our families, and the families went off, and he and I went on a hike, and we got to the top of the Grand Canyon. And it's about, roughly, a mile across. And uh, I was kind of feeling kind of up, and Steve was limping, and I thought I might could take him. And I said, let's see who can jump across to the other side. Well, Steve's a crafty old athlete. <laughs> and so I jumped, and I made it about 25 feet before I went splat at the bottom of the canyon. But then Steve went, he made it 70 feet. More than doubled my effort. He was more than twice as good at me at jumping across that Grand Canyon. And you know what? Both of us died. <laughs> we, just, we both of us just went splat, right? And when you talk about a mile across, 25 feet, 70 feet doesn't make up a lot of difference, right? So what I'm saying is, at the goodness level, Steve Bowserman may be a four, and if he's a four, I'm probably about a two. But let me show you, just I don't want you to ever fall in this trap. This is what I firmly believe. God's grace does not come in and say, you know, this is, this is zero, and this is ten, this is holiness, be ye holy as I am holy, uh, 1 Peter 1, 16, and this is what it takes to get into heaven, and I will give you my grace. Tom, you're a five, Steve, you're a four, I'm a two, and whatever you don't have, I will make up. Now, can anybody point out the fallacy of that? The assumption is that Whatever I got to to get to a five, that, then I don't need anything to cover behind that because I got that covered. When in fact I'm a zero. Ding, 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 ding. Zero. We kind of established that with all those verses, right? There's none good, not one. No one seeks God. No one does good. They together become worthless. All our, all like sheep have come astray. All our righteous acts are like filthy rags. So this is an important concept. I really want you to get is that God's grace goes all the way. It's, the song is that Jesus paid what you lacked, right? It's Jesus paid it all because all was what was required. We had nothing. God ne never a day looked at me and said, Mark, in you, in and of yourself, you've got some real potential. You've got some inherent goodness. I want to fan it into flame with my Holy Spirit wind and get you from a two to a four. And then I'm going to put down six units of grace and make up for it. And you're going to live forever in heaven. That's not it. So just a real good starting point. This is amazing grace right here. This is I'll make up what you lack grace. That's silly and wrong. So it's just amazing grace. So two great truths. So I used the phrase... Spiritual bankruptcy. I'm not a lawyer or a financial person, and I don't know what chapter 13 bankruptcy is, but I know there are two kinds of bankruptcy. Chapter 11 is what you might call temporary bankruptcy. And it's the most common. You started a business, and it's a basically healthy business, and probably something happened. One of your main suppliers went out of business, or there was a uh, they call it force majeure, an act of God that created some sort of supply disruption, or the economy just tanked spent specifically in your area of business. And it's not that you were a bad business and slowly ran it into the ground. Something just happened and you can't make your payments. You can't get your head above water. And you say, I need a timeout. I need to declare chapter 11, temporary bankruptcy. Stop the merry-go-round, and I don't know exactly that word, for a year. Give me two years. I will build the business back up. I'll slowly pay you back what you owe, but I, I need to call a time out. Then there's chapter seven bankruptcy. This company has reached the end of its financial rope. They have nothing, they've sold everything in an effort to try to keep the business going, and there's no more hope for this business. They're, they're gone. It's not only deep, deep in debt, has no future as a viable business. So, when I use the phrase spiritual bankruptcy to describe any effort we might make, 
here. I would ask you, what kind of bankruptcy is declared here? Is it temporary or permanent? So I think we all know that and believe it intellectually at this point right here. What I would ask you to ask yourself tonight, and I'll ask myself, is are we still declaring permanent bankruptcy, or have we converted to temporary bankruptcy? No one in this room, I don't believe, would ever say, it was temporary, I just needed a time out to go read the Bible some more and go on a retreat, and I'm going to come back a much better person, and I won't need this help anymore. Nobody would ever say that. But do we suddenly get into that mindset? Have we trusted in Christ alone for our salvation? Have we unconsciously or subtly reverted to a works relationship with God? Because, what's, why, why do you think you might do that? Let me just ask that as a question. What do you think? Why, why might you be tempted to do that? Our nature. Tell me more. It, it, well, you know, uh, prior, to sal to prior to salvation, that's what we believe. That's what we felt. Mm -hmm. I try a little harder, work a little bit more. Um, it's, it's our Western culture, especially here in the great old United States. Yeah. It's all about pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, being right. independent, working hard, and making something of yourself. Um, and that's all you hear. It's, it's commercials on television, on the radio, it's books that you read. It's our lifestyle, it's all we are. And That's so a great point. That battling constantly, every single day, that battle that is that. So I think you make a great point. I remember, or do I remember, ask, do I remember commercials maybe 20, 30 years ago, we don't need a handout, just a hand? Does that sound familiar to anybody? Was that like a, I don't know. <laughs> I remember something like that. It was like for the United Negro College Fund or send people to college. So it was like, we don't need a handout, just a hand. And how many, to your point, how many commercials do you see glorifying somebody or news stores glorifying somebody who's weak? <laughs> they, you know, it, it, it's the man who's a self-made man. It's, it's, it's Richard Branson, you know, took this and made it this, that kind of thing. Here's another reason. We almost never treat anybody like this. We almost never offer unconditional all go all the way grace for anybody, nor do we really expect them to offer it for us. If we ask, man, I really screwed up, Tom, I need you to forgive me, I'm still somewhere in the back of my mind thinking, what that? <laughs> right? You know, okay, I messed up. Don't make a big deal out of it. We don't treat anybody like that. So I think it's absolutely ingrained in the culture. And, and I think there's something that says, I am so grateful. I really want to pay God back in a way. I think it's hard to get rid of that. And then I, I think it's very difficult because the, the, when you start going to church, I think we have a well-intentioned and really good in a lot of ways, but maybe misguided emphasis. When somebody gets to be a, quick, a Christian, we say, well, let's start going to this discipleship class. And they learn about things that Christians do. And, and, you know, how can you say that's wrong? It's, it's not wrong. But I think we don't talk as much about being, and it's a little more about doing. Kind of hear the rules. We kind of don't do that. We kind of do that. And so I think we have maybe a, 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 mis, a disconnect in the way we disciple people. It's almost like, look, God will bring the change. We don't expect these things from you, but let's work on a heart change. Because the best way to live the Christian life is what comes out naturally. You know, I talk a lot of, about the fruit of the Spirit, and I say that it's not by willpower, it's by the Spirit. And it's really what comes out naturally. Because when I think of willpower, or I, I tend to be an impatient person, so patience is kind of the one I always go to. And it's, it's, if I say I really want to work on my patience, the absolute first thought that comes to mind is willpower. I've just got to grin it. To, to, you know, John Ortberg used to teach at Willow Creek, used to talk about doing things like purposely get to the slow lane and purposely get to the long line to try to develop patience. And I tried it twice and said, I'm going to kill somebody. <laughs> I cannot do that anymore. So I really think that we need to focus on this is who you are becoming. This is the heart you want to have. And these things will start to happen naturally. You don't have to generate this in your own power. It's the spirit coming in. So what do you think the outcome is 
of somebody who is salvation, they start to see some growth in their lives and things start to change. The desire starts to change. They start remembering verses they read. And it's like, wow, this is awesome. I'm really kind of starting to excel in this Christian life. I'm starting to look kind of like Steve and kind of like Lee. I, mean, I see some similarities now. So what happens when you fail? What happens when you fall? What's the danger there? Or were you God? Yeah. God I thought you were doing stuff for me and now I, I fell. What does it what does it do to this? What is that person tempted to think about what it does to salvation? Thought, yeah, I, I think so. It, it's kind of like I understand, hey, grace, I gotta say, there's no performance issues. I rest in the finished work of Christ. But then when you start subconsciously, subtly start putting things into, I'm doing a little bit of this, I'm starting to, you know, I find a connection, I'm doing right things, I'm, I'm not doing wrong things, and I feel better about myself, and so I'm going to try to do more of those good things and do less of those bad things, and, and you start feeling that. So when you fall, you put yourself right back on the performance treadmill, and if you don't, I, I think it's very absolutely possible and often that you'll doubt was I ever saved. And we're going to assume that this person really was. Or it's like, wow, God must not be happy with me. I wonder what kind of blessings I'm going to get now. Maybe, maybe not. Because, you know, God, have you ever seen the little thing? I hate it. It's uh, what, I can't what God did for me on the cross was his gift to me. What I do now is my gift to him. That's poppycock. It's nonsense. It should be burned and put off all the shelf. Because God is not a man that he needs anything. We don't do anything for God's benefit. That's silly. So, so I think you're right, Steve. We're all legalistic by nature. Our expectations of God's blessings begin to depend on uh, how we perform. And the typical Christian culture reinforces that. So here's the, the, the secret. It's not really a secret, but this is the thing. Like I said, Jesus <coughs> paid it all. He not only purchased forgiveness of your sins and entrance into heaven, he purchased every blessing and every answer to prayer that you will ever receive. So why is this an issue? I think it's because in a lot of ways we tend to declare a temporary bankruptcy and not permanent bankruptcy. You wouldn't answer that on a test, mind you. It's not consciously I'll wake up this morning and think I'll start pulling my own weight in this relationship now. It's subtle, I think. So there's a verse, and uh, you know, I, I knew a lot about the Bible before I ever heard or noticed this verse, but it's really apropos for this. It's Galatians 3.3. 3. And it's Paul talking to the Galatians, and if you know anything about Galatians, it's all about the law and how we're not under law anymore. It's not a covenant of the law, it's a covenant of grace, right? And here we are, amazing grace. And he says to the Galatians, he says, Are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now trying to attain your goal by human effort? That's exactly it. So if you're like me, you're thinking, well, I, I, I heard what Mark was talking about. I generally agree with it. But I didn't know there was a verse that basically says the exact same thing. But there it is. Yeah. So Galatians 3.3, 3, are you so foolish having begun the Spirit? Are you now trying to attain your goal by human effort? So let's look at these two truths on the board. Uh, Jimmy mentioned a, a series I taught twice last year called Understanding Sin and How to Kill It. And I labor to make a strong case, not only using the Bible, but some other sources, of how bad sin is. And I always tell people, why am I doing eight weeks on this? You know, it seems, it seems like you could just say sin is bad and everybody would agree and then you'd move on. But it, it pollutes, it corrupts, it masquerades, it self-deceives, it contaminates. You know, there's a, you learn great phrases, sin contaminates every, every scalpel designed to remove it. I mean, have you ever seen a righteous cause with a righteous man trying to change things for the good of others and then Eventually, he becomes kind of powerful, and the righteous man leading the righteous cause becomes not so righteous anymore. I mean, it's, it's a tough thing to eradicate. It's, it's like trying to get something wiggly, and you just can't get it. So it's a tough thing to get at. It's a tough thing to even recognize in ourselves. We all tend to have blind spots, right, about our sin. So I just taught twice, eight weeks, understanding sin and how to kill it, establishing how bad it is and how we should wage war on sin. And that even here... Not just because it separates us from God, but we should wage war on sin after salvation. We're not going to be doing it here, are we? <laughs> not many unsaved people say I'm waging war on sin today. But it happens here, and that we should take that seriously. Even as Christians who are completely saved and forgiven, 
that we should wage war on sin. And that God takes it seriously. But, I'm just as convinced, and I, I think that's a message that was timely and we all need to hear. I'm just as convinced that many of us need to hear that we can rest in the finished work, and that's the key phrase, the finished work of Christ on the cross. There's a phrase that uh, John Piper uses all the time, to rest in all that Christ promises to be for you in the Bible. All that Christ promises to be for you. We can, you know, this group, you guys know a lot of stuff, so we can, we can make a list the rest of the time, 15 minutes, about all that Christ promises to be for us. So we should do these two things. So how in the world do you balance those two things? And that's not rhetorical, I'm asking. How would you balance those two things? How many are the question mark? Balance, how can you balance what? How can you balance this concept? If we want to have the right mindset about these two eternal truths, it's we're becoming in this sanctification, you can put sanctification, your sanctification process. Should I wake up every day and say, I am waging war on sin today because it's a serious thing, God hates sin, and he doesn't like it in me, and I'm going to wage war on that today? Or should we say, I am so thankful, God, that whatever sins I commit today, they're forgiven. I can rest easy. I'm going to go out and I'm going to try to, to, to do good and, and not, but I'm not going to go to that extreme because you, your grace covers me. Now, it's, it's, it's hard to say anything wrong on either side, so I'm asking how do you balance those two? Well, I mean, I think there is there's something wrong on the, okay. on the, I'm going to go out and wage war on sin. Okay, tell me about it. Because if I'm going to wage war on sin, I'm saying I have the power to do it. Okay, okay. And I don't. And if my starting point is I'm going to wage war on sin, I'm never going to win. Okay. And I'm going to, I'm doomed to failure. So, so you're viewing that as like a willpower thing. Hey, just in the power. It doesn't of the matter how much willpower I have. I'll never do it without the Spirit. Right, right, right. So, so you're saying sanctification is a cooperative effort because we work out our salvation with fear and trembling, so, but it's powered by the Holy Spirit. Do you agree with that? Uh, Okay, okay. So absolutely right. So let me let me maybe rephrase it. We should examine ourselves to find the sin in our life and work with the power of the Holy Spirit to eradicate it. Okay. At the same time, resting easy that it's not a performance issue. So maybe I would ask, is balance even the right word? No, it's two separate things. Okay. Yeah, I mean, one, one is one, uh, you know, is sanctification, um, and the other is salvation. I mean, so that if it's one has happened, uh, and and the other is a, is not, then our lifelong becoming more like Christ. You know, surrendering, emptying ourselves of ourselves, surrendering ourselves to be in the, in the identity of Christ. Uh, so it's, it's kind of, you know, one is done totally for us by God, and yes, we can rest and, and say, I'm forgiven. And the other, then, then you have to kind of uh, pick up and, and, and with the leading of the Holy Spirit, start to work the sanctification part. And then I think there's also an element here of trying to seek God's will for your life live according to his will instead of your own will. And I think that that goes into uh, what I've been teaching this month, which is um, prayer and fasting. To try to determine, or let God reveal to you what his will is and to get more in tune with that. As we're more in tune with what God wants us to do, what his will for us is, we will live more in that way, which will move us closer to him in that relationship. Okay, all right. So since I drew this, this kind of timeline, if you will, here, oh, let me ask you something. Let's look at these two eternal truths and where they apply. So just, just kind of work with me. These three, we're all sinners. Is it true here? It's true the whole way. Is it true? Yeah, the true here is the true here. Yeah, yep. okay, all right. We're forgiven. Is it true here? Yep, mm -hmm. everywhere. Before we're saved? Uh, not before, no. It depends on your theological view. <laughs> <laughs> What's the mainstream evangelical view of some 
pagan who doesn't acknowledge God as God at all. This is not this is mm-hmm. not forgiven. Right. This is whether you're reformed or <laughs> I, I, I mean, I, I don't know the Christian tradition. I just to, to try not to get into the nuances. I'm just going to try to keep it simple. So this is no trick thing. It's just so I mean, if someone's it's sins true. aren't forgiven, are in they getting into heaven? I think in terms of I, mean, we're, I think what you're trying to get to is forgiveness starts with salvation. Yes. But you know, if you want to get into the whole thing, no. the process. Yeah, try not to. Yeah. Because would we all agree that only righteous people get into heaven? Oh, no, no, no. I, I'm going to push back and I'm going to tell you. You're wrong, most definitely. You're wrong, Glenn. Tell me, how does an unrighteous person get in heaven? They don't. Okay, how does, how does a right, it only gets a few gets in heaven, righteous people? Nobody yeah. that is totally righteous. Yeah, yes. Oh, yes. So I think we're going to teach a whole lesson now. Okay. So, we need to be praise for our sins. So, we become unrighteous, we're clean sight of God, but it's not because of our righteousness. That's right. Absolutely right. I knew that's what you meant. Let me give you a hard time. But, but you're right. But only, only righteous people get into heaven. Yeah. Are you a saint? Yes. yes. Who's saints in here? Raise your hand. Okay. Did you leave? Yeah. <laughs> Just checking. I'm saying the Bible. That's right. That's right. Because right here it happened. So, so just a quick thing. We have, we have stained, right, sin, guilt, we have bad, you know, we're unrighteous, and it's salvation. We're, we're guilty, we're under condemnation, and two things happen here, and one goes kind of part way, and the other, one, the other goes all the way. So we're guilty, under condemnation, children of wrath, and we get saved, we're declared not guilty. Everybody agree with that? Okay, all right. But it's one thing to say, you're declared not guilty. In other words, uh, on the scale of really bad and, and righteous, here's the new morally neutral. We're saying, well, you're not guilty anymore. I'm taking away all the bad things you did. Is that where Jesus stops? No. No. What happens here? <clears throat> Absolutely. Thanks, God. He declares us righteous, and that's called imputed righteousness. It's kind of like saying... Uh, Steve goes to all the cool places and I, don't, I can't get in, but Steve takes me with him. And they say, Why should I let you in, Mark? And I say, Because I'm with him. <laughs> right? It's, it's, it's his hip cool factor that gets me into this place, not me, right? So that's right. So just look at that. Yes, only righteous people get into heaven. And if you're saved, everyone is righteous, right? Okay, so we're forgiven. Just keeping it simple. We're not forgiven here. As salvation, grace covers our sin. Right? We could talk verses there. And is it true here? Right, right. But but wait a minute. Now what, what about right here when I lied? Yeah. Confess. Position. I think we can actually say this. Positionally, at the moment of our salvation, we are, in terms of our position for Christ, as we will be when we are glorified by him. So that position doesn't change. You're, sec- you're secure here. Right. Right? right. Your position in Ex- Christ experientially never changes. Yeah. Experientially, it, it's your understand. You're only up and down position. So let me talk about objective truth here. If I have a bad day, Am I covered under grace and forgiven? Yes. Mm-hmm. What if I go up and hit him in the face? Yeah, I wouldn't do it. He <laughs> would. <laughs> yeah. Right? So I'm just trying to make clear. Yeah, you did it on the love. Can you tell me the holy kiss that I got out of you? <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm so excited. So I'm trying to make it really clear that objective truth of grace working in our life doesn't change. Grace is not just for salvation anymore. Let me give you some verses, some New Testament verses that talk about grace after salvation. I was going to read these to you. Titus 2, 11 through 12. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness uh, and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, godly life. So the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all people, and training us to be obedient. Okay? 
uh, Romans 1 5 Jesus Christ our Lord through him through whom we have received grace to bring about the obedience of faith grace to not cover your sins and salvation but to bring about faith and obedience okay uh, Acts 13 43 uh, and after the meeting of the synagogue broke up many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas who as they spoke with them urged them to continue in the grace of God continue in this grace it's not just for salvation uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 9 through 10, Paul says, For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that was with me. When I worked for the kingdom of God, it was God's grace doing that. 2 Corinthians 9, 8, God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having, so the purpose, why is he making all grace abound to you? So that you may abound in every good work. Last one, 2 Peter 3, 18. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We should grow in that. So Stephen said something about this sanctification process where we can be conformed to the image of Christ. Romans 8, 29. Where those who are before, before they be predestined to become conformed to the image of Christ. This thing that says, Paul says, it wasn't I for the grace of God that was working within me. There's that echoes of Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 that says, it is not, I'm sorry, Galatians 3, 20 that says, I live, but yet not I. So it's Christ who lives in me. So and you use the word emptying, which I love. There is an emptying here. A, a, a lesson, you know, your, your lesson thing, the first time you did less, I still got it on my desk. But this is, you know, John says, I must increase and he must increase. So there is this emptying aspect to this. So, uh, finally, since we're starting to, to get down to the end, here, here's the last little part. Galatians 5, 1. It is for freedom that Christ sets you free. It is for freedom that Christ sets you free. I love it when a verse just seems really plain and simple. That, that's kind of the way I am. So, plain and simple. Christ has set us free from the bondage of sin we're freed from the penalty of sin. Ongoing, we're freed from the power of sin. And ultimately, we're going to be freed from the presence of sin. Okay? So, it is for freedom that Christ saves. So, salvation, Christ set us free. For what purpose this verse talks about, it's for freedom. So, it's really clear that we are to live in freedom. And to be clear, I'm not saying, so this is the winner and we don't do this. Right? I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying... Personality, I would love to have more time to discuss how personality plays it. How many of you would say that I tend to be on this side that kind of worries about my performance, but on the other hand, I'm pretty good about being aware of sin in my life and trying to get rid of it. I understand I'm not resting in the grace so much, but I, I do take this seriously. How many of you would say you have more of that kind of personality? Anybody? Okay. How many of you would say I find it easy to rest in the grace? Now, every once in a while, maybe I kind of take it, maybe I don't take sin seriously enough. But my, my wife is a worrier. So she is here. She wants to do things right. She doesn't like it if she doesn't do things right. Which is a great thing because she, over history, I mean, she, she is a very conscientious person. So she's here. But you know what she struggles with? She struggles with here. I mean, we'll have talks. And this is one of the best people I've ever known in my life. And she said, I just don't know how. And it drives me crazy. But then there are people here who say, I don't worry about that sin stuff. It's covered, baby. <laughs> Which is Galatians 6, 1, right? Since God's grace abounds in the presence of sin, should we sin all the more so that grace may abound? May it never be, right? How can one who is dead to sin still live in it? Because we're dead to sin here. So it's for freedom that Christ set us free. If we're not living in freedom here, we're doing it wrong. So to close, let me give you a little test. I'm going to read you about 12, 13 things. You know you don't fully understand grace when you live with a vague sense of his disapproval. When you feel sheepish bringing your needs before him and you just fail. When you feel you deserve an answer to prayer because of your hard work and sacrifice. When you assume that 1 John 1, 9 that says that we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When you assume that verse doesn't apply anymore because you've sinned so many times, you've used up all your credit. 
Meaning you feel more confident before him in prayer because you've had a quiet time seven days in a row. When you can't honestly see, say that you see yourself as blameless and a saint in his eyes. When you don't really believe deep down that he could possibly like you or even love you. When you can think of someone you look down on. Some of these you tell are kind of flip sides of it, right? When you shy away from asking him for things because you think it annoys him. This is a good one. When you haven't been tempted to sin because you know it's covered. When you believe you've been called into his service because of your worthiness or qualifications. When you feel that the day may not go as well as expected because you didn't read your Bible that morning. Lastly, when you think you can do something to make, you, make him love you more or less. So what I want to encourage us all to do is to do both these things. You know, there's a big business concept the last 20 years. I read it first in a book called Built to Last. If you're in business, you may have read it. Uh, 20 years or so ago, and it says it's not either or, it's both and. That's what this is. This is both and. You should absolutely take sin seriously. God still hates sin after we're saved. But we should also do, do the best we can to do this. So I'm going to leave with this. There's a, a songwriter named Andrew Peterson whom I just love. And when he writes a, a song, there are no throwaway lines in it. So I'm just going to recite to you the lyrics to this song. It's a great, great song. It says, what's that on the ground is what's left of my heart. Somebody named Jesus broke it to pieces and planted the shards. Now they're coming up green and they're coming in bloom. I can hardly believe this is all coming true. Just as I am, just as I was, just as I will be, he loves me. He does. Show me the day that he shed his own blood. He loves me. Oh, he loves me. All of my life, I've held on to this fear that these thistles and vines, so now he's, now he's here. Okay, that was salvation, now he's here. All of my life I've held on to this fear that these thistles and vines that ensnare and entwine the flowers that appear, it's the fear that I'll fall one too many times. It's the fear that his love is no better than mine. Just as I am, he loves me. Last, and this kind of just, you kind of just think, what's a good song? And then he's, well, it's time now to harvest. There's fruit. It's time now to harvest what little that grew. This man they call Jesus who planted the seeds has come for the fruit. And you kind of thinking, oh my gosh, it's, it's harvest time and I got little, little offerings. Uh, so it says, it, the planting the seeds has come for the fruit. <clears throat> uh, now I gotta sing it. I gotta sing it to get it. So uh, let's see, it's time now to harvest what little that grew. This man called Jesus who planted the seeds has come for the fruit. Uh, and the best that I've got is it nearly enough? Well, he's glad for the crop, but it's me that he loves. Praise God. We should just have a Bible right now. Do you realize that? All, the fruit you produce is awesome, but it's you that he loves. He doesn't love your product, what you produce for him. He loves you, whether it's a little crop or a big crop. Which encourages me to be faithful and produce stuff. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just praise you. And shout hallelujah to you right now, Lord, for your grace. It is truly amazing. Father, there's not a person in this room who's had 10 seconds that deserves anything from you. But we thank you that every good and perfect gift comes from you. Thank you that you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. That though we fluctuate and go up and down, our faithfulness is it's almost never there. I thank you that your faithfulness is great. Your mercies and loving kindness are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Father, we just praise you for that. And thank you for this group of men and women, Lord, who want to teach your word and spread this truth to others. And I pray that you would make us productive and effective. And Father, we're full of weaknesses, but we boast in those. Help us to boast in those. And we pray that you would use us in our weakness. In Jesus' name, amen. That's hard to do that, and then I got to do more. <laughs> That's hard. <laughs> All right. So the topic tonight is how uh, to develop a lesson plan. And if there was ever a topic that, you know, there's not one way of doing it, and everybody has their own ways of doing it, and you all have been doing this mostly a long time, and you kind of come up with what works and what doesn't. So I'm just going to take 10, maybe 15 at most minutes to share what I do and what's worked for me. Uh, 
and maybe some things that I don't do very well. And then, uh, I don't know if we'll get to everybody, but just get some things that you guys do. And to me, there, there's two really different things. There's, there's, we're going through Ephesians, and so you're looking at Ephesians, maybe the first chapter or the first four verses or whatever, and, and you're learning what the passage says. And then there's topic, you know, so you're fasting and praying or, or grace or whatever. So uh, for whatever reason, I chose to focus on topic, I think because uh, I have a much harder time organizing the information in the topic than I do just having the passage of breath. That's a little easier for me, so I chose the, the harder one. So uh, the first thing that I try to do, and I try to do this more lately than I ever have in my history, is uh, what does the class need? So that speaks to, as the teacher, knowing your people. So uh, that's one of the things that I think, I don't know if any of you could relate to this, but it's still difficult going and teaching people I don't know. That's kind of hard. <clears throat> when I know people, I can kind of look them in the eye and speak to a person I know, and when they, you don't know them, it's a little harder. Uh, does anybody relate to that? Let's see if a couple of minutes. Yeah. So uh, I, I meant to bring it, I'll send it to Jenny. There's a thing I just read maybe a month ago uh, about nine questions to ask to exegete your people. <laughs> Talk about exegeting the text, but you've got to make the connection between the text and the, the teaching and the people. So, uh, you know, what is a good topic for us? So we pray about that. So you got grace. And then, well, what are the, what are the things? What are the temptations? Because if we, this is going to be a four-week series. So we're going to talk about the temptations for, for legalism on this side and licentiousness, or cheap, easy grace, you might call it, on this side. So we'll, we'll get into those things. We'll get more into personalities and that kind of thing. So I've asked, okay, what's the danger in our world, the way we're living now, and the people I know? What, what do they need to hear about grace? And just like we did with us tonight, I, I think the focus is really here. Um, on resting in the finished work of Christ. And there's nothing we can add to that. So that's the first thing to start. So then, uh, for grace, for example, it's, it's background. So grace is not like a new fasting and praying. I've done a little bit here and there, but you know, that, that's a lot of new stuff for me, probably. Uh, and I'm not a very good prayer. Uh, but grace, I've studied some, so I had some things. So I went back and thought, okay, what have I read? And maybe what should I read? I know a lot of you are readers, which is awesome. Uh, so I think about what's that? What have I maybe taught before? So in this case, I looked back. I have lessons all the way back to 93, so I looked at some lessons there. And then the, the key thing, tell me if this makes sense to you with, with a topic. And you know, most of us in here teach, at least for some reason, some to some degree, because we are learners and we, we have some things inside that we think are great and want to share, right? So this may resonate with this, that the hardest thing is, is limiting it and figuring out what's the best and most important because you come across so much good stuff. And what's really helped is the TNT stuff about focusing uh, and maybe leaving a little room, more room for margin and for discussion and that kind of thing. That's really helped me and I really tried to, to do that. So uh, I don't know, I'm curious how many people use a Bible software of some kind? What do y'all use in this case? Um, Bible stuff. Okay. Waters. Oh. Luminous. Ah, yeah, yeah, okay. So, so that's a great help. And it's amazing what they've done with just on the internet now without any software. You, the studies you can do is really awesome. So I'll do that. And lots of times I'll make a passage list. So uh, grace is kind of hard because there's so many, so you got to really pick. But, but prayer and fasting, maybe there's fewer. And uh, I just make a list, it might be one or two pages, and I try to read that from time to time because if, if you're a reader and a learner, you find that you just kind of soak things up. So probably the overarching concept of what I do could be described as soaking up a lot of information over a long period of time and letting it marinate. And then about two weeks before I teach, I take a blank piece of paper out and start mapping it out, kind of like this, in some visual, structural, conceptual conceptual form, because maybe it's the engineer in me, but I just, I, I, when there's so much stuff, I look for those anchors to hang the truths on, you know, here's the three big things, and this, so I wanted to, so I use, uh, it's not specifically this, uh, probably technically, but have you ever heard of the concept or done a mind map? That sounds to me, anybody done that? All right, so I thought as an example, um, I, I volunteer to teach on 
on the Holy Spirit. So what you do is you take your main topic and put it in the middle of the page. So I want you to help me. And then you're going to see why I kind of panicked after I volunteered to do this. Tell me just, if, if, if somebody said, teach on the Holy Spirit, just tell me a, a, a kind of a, some, an aspect of the Holy Spirit that you think that, that's a subject. Just give me one. Sorry? Helper. Helper? Okay, okay, that's a word that describes. So you could do a subject on how he helps us. I, I go with that. But, but think a little bit broader, bigger categories. Um, my present. Yeah, so you're, what you're giving me is words that describe and That's the correct <clears throat> thing to do. Let me give you one. Okay, Paul. How about, okay, how about tongues? Let me just start with that one. I don't know if you've thought about that, but that's a subject for tongues. Okay? The whole, you said, Steve, that the Holy Spirit is the, and you said that the power for spirit-filled living, for sanctification, right, indwelling. So there's, a, I'll just call it sanctification, or, or, or I would say spirit-filled living. So, you know, I think it's Ephesians 5, 18, don't get drunk with wine, that's dissipation, but rather be filled with the Spirit. So what does it mean, oh, I should put that. What does it mean to be filled with the Spirit? Because that kind of goes up here too, right? Because charismatics have a certain belief and the mainstream evangelicals have another. What else comes to mind in the Holy Spirit? The deposit. Okay. Seal. Seal. <laughs> so I'm going to put salvation and put seal because that's the deposit, the seal, the guarantee. What about, is the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament? That may or may not be a whole Sunday topic, but you can put Old Testament. Has it really been around that long? Is it a new thing? Right. What else? Anything else? Gifts. Ah, see, now you're getting it. Gifts of the Spirit, right? All right, what else? Fruits. Wow, fruit of the Spirit, you're on a roll. This is about when I started panicking. <laughs> Give me one or two more. Can you take one or two more? What about, and this is a little bit of a stretch, but you could, you wouldn't, I certainly wouldn't have to, but you could kind of take the Trinity aspect of it. You might get combined that with the Old Testament. That, that's enough to show that. So then you might say, okay, gifts of the Spirit, so used in service, and how do you know? which ones you have, and you can kind of keep going off, and you just kind of make branches, and you kind of have a central topic, and one of the stuff, and so that kind of helps you organize information. That's a really big scale there. So uh, these kind of things, I try to think in terms of major concepts, because I, I get, I've I got a very good memory for things I read and hear, uh, which is awesome, except it just leads me to try to do too much. So not that, Specifically, this is any help to you, but for what it's worth, this on the front and back are a couple of scribbles uh, that uh, I did for this grace series. It just shows you kind of how I map things out. And then what I typically, so, so I've been marinating, hopefully for six weeks or so, reading and going through verses and just thinking about it. And then I'll get, and, and I always kind of panic a little bit because there's just so much of which direction do I go? And so then I start mapping this stuff out a little bit. And then I go to my wife, who's so usually sitting at the kitchen table reading her Bible. And I go there and I say, let's talk about this. And she says, well, what about this? And I'm going to take the green pen and write something down. Uh, so, oh, well, what about that? Well, yeah, so, you know, like, I think one that she said, well, my personality tends towards, you know, legalism a little bit. And I, I have trouble believing God really loves me all the time. Right? So, so oh, personality. So I write that down. So this just helps me start to cogitate <laughs> on all this and start, start putting. So I got, so I still, today, I do not have what the four divisions of the information will be. And I, I teach Sunday. But that's not unusual. Uh, but I've got the framework in place that, like, the bigger, more complicated one on there, I can just kind of say, I think I'll kind of do this. Right? So it'll be some of what we did tonight. Uh, so one thing that's really helped is when I felt more like a lecturer, and, and I'll be honest with you, I think I'm a pretty good speaker, but it's better with more discussion. I absolutely understand and believe that. Uh, but when I used to think of myself as more of a lecturer, it was harder because I had to come up with 45 minutes worth of stuff, right? 
So I love that Steve, when you came up here, you talked the way you talked. That was a real eye opener for me. It's very helpful for me. And so the second time, I don't know if you listened to the second time. The second time I talked sin and how to kill it. I don't, I don't know if it's very different, but it's significantly, measurably different in how I taught it. I really condensed it down and said, here's the two things I want to talk about. They were pretty talkative group. And I used the whiteboard a lot. I'm very comfortable doing that. I don't know if it's good or not, but I'm comfortable doing it. And it was, it was an eye-opener experience for me to teach that in built to last compared to the other two times I taught that. Much better for everybody. And it was easier for me in preparation time, too. So it was win-win. So then I map that structure out. Um, I look for places where good questions are. So when I write my notes, usually it's in Word, uh, I'll, I put a question mark in two or three spaces. And, and so you kind of visually kind of see where the question marks are. Uh, tonight, I had a lot of stuff typed uh, because I focused a lot on this and, and, and getting all four weeks of information in my head. And I still don't really know exactly what I'll teach Sunday. So, but Sunday, by the time Sunday gets here, I'll have a visual for that day, and I'll have very little notes. I'll usually just have a handout of verses, and uh, the visual, and a few notes, or, and I'll just talk from that. So I usually don't have to read as much as I did tonight. Uh, so what scriptures are needed, what questions to ask. Um, that, that's about it. So there's, I don't have any great, you know, here's how to do it, other than what works for me. So I thought we'd spend a few minutes. Uh, and what I asked you to ask is, is you know, one minute, because we've got so many people here, and choose whether you want to tell us how you prepare a topic or a more biblically focused passage. We won't go in any order or anything, but who would say, well, I tried this and this didn't work, or this is what works for me? Who would start us off? Glenn. <laughs> <laughs> um, on a topically subject type of thing, I try to gather as much information as I can from multiple different sources. Even though this is a church and we're talking about biblical truths and the like, it's also good to take a view as what's well the world's position on the thing. Yeah. And so I do a lot of exploring on the internet to find out what it has to say about the topic and divide it up into the sections that are talked about. Here's what the world's view is. Here's what some churches view it. And here's what my view is type of thing and, and try to spread it apart to cover the topic so that people can see that there's a difference between a Christian view versus the world view. Okay? Okay. How do you so you have a lot of information coming so how do you distill it down to what you want to teach on any given day, Sunday? Um, I usually prepare a long time in advance before leading subjects. Like uh, uh, last year in December, I taught one on the truth about the Gospels. I have been working on that for over three years. And so I pulled this all together and, and, and presented the material in a way that talked about different things that I wanted to focus on. One was as well, why do people in the world say that the Gospels are unreliable? And so we focused on the genealogies. That's one of the big hangouts people have. And then we focused on uh, things that are different between one Gospel and another telling the same stories and what these differences are. <clears throat> Identified those differences in actually try to torpedo them as to why those assumptions were wrong. And it took a while to go through that, but you broke it up into weeks that focused on different subjects. So, okay, okay. All right. Unless somebody over here. I, I probably do it similar to what, the way you do it, both, both topically and you know, if it's a book study. Um, uh, if, it's topic, if it's a topical study, uh, it, it, there's a lot more, there's a lot more, there's a, a, a larger breadth of, of, uh, of reading that I might, you know, I'll, I'll usually try to get two or three books that are kind of key books in an area and, and read those in addition to scripture. If it's a book study, I teaching Ephesians, um, maybe four or five months before 
I'm going to teach it, I'll just read Ephesians every week. Yeah. I'll just for you know for two months um, every you know every three or four days I'll have gone through Ephesians and, and I'll start it, sit down and read it through, and then sit down and read it through, and then after I after I feeling like I've gotten the a sense a, a sense of the entire book a theme. Understand, you know the the direction, the author, and and and, and the message that God is trying to bring through the author. Then it's like, okay, now let's dissect it, and then I'll pull out, and I'll usually try to do it without a study Bible at first, just a, a Bible without notes and a, and just the text, and then I'll get my study Bible out and a concordance, and I'll start digging and going back through. And so I'll take three or four months and just kind of tear it apart and um, um, get into it that way. That's good. You know, when I talk about marinating a long time, I think it makes the lesson so much better because you're not saying, okay, what was next and what do I want to say, you know, this kind of thing. So when it's kind of like I talked about the fruit of the Spirit coming naturally, you, you've Cogitated on it so long that, that it, it's coming. All you need is a few reminders. Right. Yeah. That, that's that's great. Well, it's funny. And, and, you, and the other thing that you find is that I mean, these are truths. And the thing that you find with truth is it's it's active. It's living. And you find it in day in life, day to day. And so there are when I'm immersed in that book, I'll suddenly as I'm as I'm dealing with stuff, I'll say. Oh, this just happened, or I just had this conversation with so and so, and it's like, oh, you know, that that applies to these verses right here, mm -hmm. and so it, it's kind of looking at it in, in a di in a different light. You're seeing it through that lens, that Ephesians lens, or that Colossians yeah. lens, or whatever, whatever, or if it's a if it's a biblical character, you're, you're looking at it through that lens. That's a great point. Kind of like when you say you're going to buy another car and you're looking at Cords and Camrys, and you see them everywhere, right? That's a great one. So I think one thing, you know, everybody has their own way, and that's fine, but I think one thing we could say is really beneficial, probably universal, is early start, right? So you have time to really think through these things. Yeah, yeah. So one, but there's a danger in that, too, and I hopefully make it less, uh, make this mistake less than I used to, but when I would try to do too much, I, I knew it so well, that I would do something of kind of, you know, really make you think about something, but I thought about it for two months, so I, I'm going on to the next thing, and they're like, what? <laughs> I gotta think about that, what you just said. I don't think you may have just screwed up, Mark. So I guess you do it, and that's another uh, vote for, you know, you could teach seven things, right, but I'm gonna get these two today, right, so they have time to process. That's a good point. Who else? Lee? Well, I when I read that email, I said, well, I was decided on a topic in the recliner. Because so you got to have a good recliner. Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell my wife. <laughs> yeah, the sun shining in the window in the morning and uh, that recliner and, and reading and doing and something comes up. Well, i gotta, gotta look. I got to look a little deeper in that or i got to find something in it come out. Uh, just a year ago, about this time, Sometime this thing the world views was coming up. And you were just mentioning, okay, what in the scriptures helping us to understand our world view in light of what it should be or could be? Or, and then he was reading Hebrews. And why? And, and the first thing everybody asked me, world view, Hebrew, studying Hebrews, what, what does that got to do with each other? And uh, it took weeks to. To figure that out, it, it really has a lot to do uh, with us working through our worldview in light of what the Scripture has to say. And even if it's a lot of Old Testament understanding for our New Testament lives, uh, anyway. It, but it started that way. And you and I are, uh, all right, what is God saying to me? And what is it I don't understand that I need to understand more fully? So, so Hebrews is, is a I don't know, maybe not for you. Hebrews is tough one for me. I mean, it would, it's not, you know, Philemon or anything. Right. <laughs> or Philippians, right. fairly straightforward, you know. That's a tough one. So, so you made me think of something that, that I struggle with. 
Um, so if you're going to teach Ephesians, six chapters, I believe. So uh, how many of you have had good success and no real problems with doing, let's just say, 12 weeks, sorry, uh, yeah, 12 weeks on Ephesians? Or how many of you would be concerned? I know that's only, I mean, that's, that's not a small, a half a chapter is not, you could do a lesson on two verses, right? So half a chapter is not like you're doing, but you're still 12 weeks out. So what are your thoughts on telling your class, if you had a class that you were with all the time, telling your, or anybody, we're doing 12 weeks on Ephesians. You think worrying that would scare people off? Or it could be broken up. Uh, one of the things that I did was in our Saturday morning men's Bible study, um, I did uh, fill them in between a lot of other people by breaking up uh, First Peter, okay. which I had 20 lessons on, okay. just out of First Peter. Okay. Well, so you just kind of. I would do two or three or four, and then they would go to somebody else, and I would do some more, and go to somebody else. But I had 20 different Peter principles that I taught during about a two-year period of time, just by taking three or four at a time. That's good. good. Any other thoughts on that question? So it's a group of people, for the first time, and you're going to spend three and a half years going to Genesis Revelation. I'm still going to convince Jane that was the right thing to do. <laughs> But I mean, that's how we introduced the class in yeah. Sunday, you know, yeah. the next three and a half years, only Genesis to Revelation. Okay. And I'm still trying to find something to teach Revelation. <laughs> you got thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, one of the things that, that I, when I was in seminary, one of the things that one of my professors taught me, gave us, particularly for biblical narrative. So, you know, most, a lot of the Old Testament, you know, the Gospels and Acts in the New Testament, the framework that, that I've used for my own, you know, um, study, but then also in how I, I started teaching a lot of things is, is the concept of pictures, windows, and mirrors. So when I'm looking particularly at biblical uh, narrative, the first step is to look through, look through the window. So I'm looking out and observing it. And the image that I was, that I was have in my head is from the uh, Bill Gibson movie Patriot when he walks into the farmhouse and he's standing there with his son and they're watching the battle in front of him and he's describing to his son you know, what's taking place. So that's kind of the first step. It's like looking through the window and I'm just observing what's happening. Uh, then I'm looking at the picture. You know, now I'm looking at the artist's concept of, of that, you know, that, you know, that narrative, that battle, whatever. And I'm looking at you know, every you know, step far back and seeing the big picture and it's, you know, it, it's you know, in the grand scheme of things. Then I come in and I start looking at the small things, kind of like going to the, uh, uh, the thing was the thing that the battle, you know, about the battle of the battle. Is that the no, the cycle of the Okay, so you go to the cycle of the mountain and you, 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 got this, you step back and you see this huge, you know, miniature layout of the entire battle. And then you start going in and looking at little pieces of it. And so that's, you know, that's the, you know, looking at the picture. And then finally I try to mirror myself. How does that reflect on me? What it, and so I use that in my preparation. Uh, when I'm, like I said, especially when I'm looking at biblical narratives, uh, trying to, you know, take those, those three approaches to it and then bring that into the lesson. Uh, and sometimes I'll focus on the, you know, looking at it through the window. Sometimes I'm looking at it and turning the mirror around on, on myself or on, you know, on each other. But, and sometimes it's all three. That's a good framework. I like frameworks. That's a good framework. Thank you. You, you raised a question just before he was coming on, and his preparation was that short period or long period, uh, did that come out of classes asking for shorter, Six week things, or or is that you know all of a sudden most of the classes are under that uh, uh, every six weeks got to change or something? No, it, it didn't come out of anything. Other than it came out of Keith Duncan and I kind of team teach. I teach most of the time, and Keith fills in. Give okay. me a break for the most part. And so we were talking about. 
So I was thinking, I thought I was being pretty generous in breaking and covering, you know, half a chapter a week. So it was like eight or ten weeks. And Keith's thought is, uh, I, don't, man, I don't know one topic. People kind of like to change up every once in a while. So we just had two different views on that. And uh, my, my issue is I really love kind of digging in. So, so here would be a quick question. So it, it's not going to happen in the it happens in solo scriptura. So a little more verse by verse expositional kind of expository kind of thing. It doesn't happen in the worship service, and it typically doesn't happen in our classes. I don't think that kind of verse by verse type thing. I don't, and I don't think that happens in core groups or other things. So where is that just strictly personal Bible study or? You know, I don't, I, don't, I mean, what's, so what am I going to do, teach Philippians for a year, like that? I mean, no, so, <laughs> that just kind of bothers me a little bit. Are we left to our own devices to do that, or, I don't know. Part of it, I think, is, is the, the class that you're dealing with, and, and that goes back to one of the first comments you made about knowing the people that you're teaching. Um, I, I think if you're, familiar, like, the class that you teach most of the time, you have a pretty good sense of, are they folks who are willing to do Ephesians in 12 weeks? Yeah, yeah. Or are they in Ephesians in six weeks kind of class? And so I guess there's a, there's a way that you can do it both ways. You, you know, you can do the let's dig through and, and let's, let's tear it apart. And, and you know, maybe, you know, the, 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 the last, you know, chapter six, you're not going to spend a ton of, a ton of time on. Um, and you're going to add that extra class into into one and two, yeah. but um, but if you're going to do, you could also do it over four or five weeks, and you just take your thirty thousand foot view right. and you right. look for major themes mm -hmm. and you focus on a major theme. And so rather than than doing it that way, you you choose the two or three themes or the single theme that you want to take through the book, and and that's what you pour in. You do that. You take the, the main theme yeah. and you get it from the direction you're talking about. Yeah. And you know, I, I, I have nothing against that. It, it does just bother me a little bit of where, I mean, when they passed it, when they sent the letter of Philippians to the church of Philippi, I bet they didn't just say, here's a few couple, I'm not going to read it to you. I'm just going to give you the main themes. You know, <laughs> I think it was meant to be. So, anyway, it's not that it's wrong, but uh, maybe one more. Well, two things. Uh, Steve's point about uh, immersing yourself in whatever it is, whether it's a scriptural study or a topical study uh, focused on particular passages is right on. And you really need to get immersed in that particular thing. Second thing is, nobody's mentioned it, but it's become really critical with me, is praying each time I enter into whatever I'm preparing is, is God, what do you want to communicate through me in this particular material? Uh, so it's making sure that uh, you're open to the Spirit's guidance in your own thinking, in your own sense, in terms of what He wants to get across to the people. And then thirdly is what uh, uh, Glenn mentioned is just immersing yourself in a lot of research um, to get in as much perspective as you can uh, and then building in personal applications and personal uh, experience. So. Thank you so much for bringing up the point about prayer. That's a great point. Thank yes. you for making that. Uh, so, uh, how many of you, a couple of you mentioned the illustrations and that kind of thing. How many of you have come up with an illustration in the middle of your lesson? You didn't have it in the three months you spent it before, but that day it comes up. Isn't that kind of funny? Kind of weird. So I just want to uh, leave you kind of according to the prayer thing. Uh, there's a quote by John Stott on teaching, and it says, Our plea is not for perfect people to teach, and praise the Lord for that. Uh, our plea is not for perfect people to teach, but rather that we would go about the work in a serious and diligent way, praying as we do so that the Lord will be pleased to use us in our weakness. So that's a, that's a good one. Is this basically it? So I'll pray and we'll be... Okay. Dear Heavenly Father, again, thank you so much for everyone here, uh, for the lessons we've learned tonight uh, in many ways. Father, I pray that we would make that 
switch in our heads to be able to truly boast about it. It just sounds silly to me, you know. <laughs> it's a difficult concept for me to boast about my weaknesses. Father, I pray that we would be able to boast about that, that you would be magnified, that we would uh, rest so much in your finished, completed work on the cross that we would renounce everything, uh, all our claims, as Paul did in Philippians 3, Lord. We would just count it as rubbish compared with the surpassing value of knowing you are Lord. Father, May our excitement and hunger for your glory be so deep and so passionate inside us that it just spreads naturally when we teach, uh, that we would have the aroma of Jesus and having been with you around us when we teach, that you would be the hero of every lesson we teach, that people would come to know you either in salvation or in a deeper way every time we teach. And thank you for my brothers and sisters, and thank you for Jeannie and Jeff for organizing all this. And just ask that we would be a blessing to you, that you would empower us to live by your Spirit and spread your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <clears throat>